Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Perhaps especially appropriate given that much of the globe is glued to the World Cup at the moment, we're excited to kick off this week a series of shows on AI and sports. While I'm not personally the biggest sports fan, my producer Imari is a huge sports follower and this series has been something he's wanted to see since we started working together. So if you like these shows, be sure to hit him up on Twitter at at Twimmel underscore Imari, I-M-A-R-I. Before we get into the show, a quick update about July's Twimmel online meetup. On July 17th, At 5 p.m. Pacific time, Nick Teague will lead a discussion on the paper Quantum Machine Learning by Jacob Biamonte et al. The paper explores how to devise and implement concrete quantum software for accomplishing machine learning tasks. If you haven't joined our meetup yet, visit twimmelai.com slash meetup to sign up. Also, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter. I recently shared a write-up detailing the machine learning and AI job board we're working on and got a ton of encouragement and interest. To make sure you don't miss anything, head over to twimmelai.com slash newsletter. In this episode, I'm joined by Sinead Flahiv, data scientist at Dublin, Ireland-based Kitman Labs. Sinead joined me to discuss Kitman's athlete optimization system which allows sports trainers and coaches to collect and analyze data for player performance optimization and injury reduction. In our conversation, we take a look at the different ways this data is collected and analyzed and the various modeling techniques Sinead and her team use to create player insights for coaches and trainers. Sinead also shares her view of the data-driven sports landscape and how it's evolving. Enjoy. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Sinead Flahiv. Sinead is a data scientist with Kitman Labs based in Dublin, Ireland. Sinead, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me. Uh, Delighted to be here. Let's get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started and interested in data science and machine learning. Yes, so I took not a direct route into the, the data science area. I initially studied financial mathematics and actuarial science in my undergraduate. Towards the end of the undergraduate, I was more interested in more statistical type-based modules. And my um, university was very accommodating and allowed me to to, to kind of change the, the traditional modules that, that I should have been sitting. And I ended up doing more st- statistics um, modules that, than traditional. So while my undergrad degree is financial maths and actuary, I traditionally probably have more of a statistics degree. So I began working straight out of university um, for a statistical analysis consulting company where I would was doing statistical analysis um, using uh, software and for consulting, doing lots of projects um, across lots of different areas. And I was really enjoying it. And I liked the variety and the different types of data sets that I was working with. So I continued on myself and did a master's in business analytics. So that steered me more towards the the data science role. So that position, I grew into more of a data science role there in terms of the manipulation of data, performing more analysis into into deployment of models um, going forward. So when I moved on from that position, one of the things that struck me was I, I was very much more enthusiastic about working with data sets that, that were interesting. Um, so there's an abundance of data out there, as we all know, and it's growing very regularly. That I was more enthusiastic and excited about data sets that I had a passion for. Um, and I would be quite a keen sports fan myself. So when the opportunity came to, to work with a, a sports data set, as, a, as I get to do daily now in, in Kitman Labs, where I'm working, that, that I, I jumped at the opportunity. So that was how, how I got into working in, in data science at sport is kind of combining two key passions of mine, the data science side of it and, and getting to work with a really interesting data set as well. Oh, very nice. What are your favorite sports? I would be a keen rugby union fan. Okay. 
Um, so in in Ireland, we've been we're quite successful in rugby union. We we recently won a, a national competition um, where we play our closest competitors called the Six Nations and the Irish rugby team who are one of our customers here in Kitman Labs won that outright so they beat every other team and we were involved in that and contributed in some small way I like to think (laughs) awesome Um, yeah and in Ireland then we have our national sports so they're amateur sports um so there there's Gaelic football and hurling which is uh quite a it's kind of like hockey but at a, at a much faster pace that we have here in Ireland. So they would be kind of my own uh, sporting. I don't play any of them, mind you, but um, <laughs> to, 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 to follow um, and to keep up with. Awesome. And so what does Kitman Labs do and, and what's its role in the sporting arena? Yeah, so here at Kitman Labs, we have developed um, an athlete optimization system. So our athlete optimization system enables training and medical staff for elite sports team teams to collect and analyze their data in that way they can optimize performance and they can reduce the risk of injury because we collect um electronic me- electronic medical records from our teams as well so uh, as 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 we have um kitman labs have a dashboard um that v- allows the practitioners to look at the current status of all of their athletes based on their own data collected in their systems so we have certain ways that data is ingested into our system so we have we have our own app that athletes can enter in different things on so kind of subjective measures how are they feeling how did they sleep last night do they have any muscle soreness we also have as i mentioned the electronic medical record system where the medical staff in the in the the clubs would enter injuries when they occurred where in the body they are so that gives us a lot a lot of information on the injuries we also allow the practitioners to input other kind of objective tests so if if an athlete was doing a a screening is what we we tend to call it they would do things like check their um hip mobility or their ankle mobility and there's different tests that that do all these things so the the coaches would enter that information for their their athletes entire system as well and then we also have a, a capability that allows um our teams to ingest all of the GPS type metrics. So you, you've probably seen it on the on the the TV. Sometimes they wear the the vests that have the the GPS monitors inside in them. Okay. And that 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 all gets in, ingested into into our system as well. So we have a we're in a unique position then, whereby we are allowed we are able to link all of that injury from information to all of the other information that the athletes provide or that their coaches give us. Um, and one of our one of our aims is to identify um drivers of injury risk based on all that information that we collect from the from the athletes interesting so you're collecting a lot of information off the field you mentioned the gps vests are you also is there some way that you're capturing uh you know, rugby, it's a, a contact sport uh, from what I've seen. Is there a way that you're capturing uh, impacts and contact and that kind of uh, thing as well? N- not directly. So through the through the GPS metrics um, that come through from the, the providers, there's lots of different vendors um, that we work with who provide this information. They're one of their metrics that they would include would be number of impacts. Okay. So we get that information. It, it comes in as part of the, the the GPS. That type of data we would consider workload data. Okay. So it's what 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 exertion did the athlete perform on the pitch, whether it was in training and sometimes during in games. In in some leagues, they're not permitted to wear the GPS units during games, but if if it's available, we have it. When the injury information comes in in our electronic medical records, the practitioners would tag whether the injury came from a contact activity or a non-contact activity if it was just a something that flared up over time and so the sports teams now have you know you've mentioned already tons of different sources of data and i'm envisioning other things like fitbit devices and you know even uh data that's extracted from like computer vision models of the field, the pitch and the players, you know, I I imagine these teams are, um, you know, have quickly gotten to a point where they're awash in data and need to figure out how to use that data to be more competitive. Like what does the overall landscape of data driven sports look like from your perspective? Yes. So as you mentioned, and you're hundred percent correct, there's 
the velocity, volume and variety of data being collected these days, it's such in a fast paced sporting environment, it can cause a problem, which here we, we kind of call paralysis by analysis. I think that's a general general term anyway. What we have found is that things like the tech wearables, the Fitbits, etc., they deliver data and measurements back to the athletes. However, the, the kind of crux of it and, and where we kind of come in is they get the data and measurements, but it's the real insights based on the linking of all the data together is what we do here at, at Kitman Labs. So what we've kind of found is that while you have more data, that can lead to more decisions. But more data here does not necessarily mean that, that you have better decisions. So our key service, I suppose, from an analytical point of view that we provide is driving insights for our teams based on the the data that that they put into our system. And so those insights, it sounds like, are primarily around, uh, you know, performance and how how to optimize it on, um, well, let me ask, is it is it on an athlete by athlete basis or is it on a team basis? Um, and is it, uh, well, let's start there. Yeah, so our data set, we have, and like, we have our, our system um, in 120 sports teams across 35 leagues. So therefore, we have a lot of data ingested. What you will find is that the insights that, that you would discover, they vary sport to sport, position to position, and, and as you mentioned, athlete to athlete. And that's one of the things that, that that's, that's really interesting about our, our problem here when we try to solve based on say one one of the things as as i mentioned was was based on injury risk as it, as is in most areas if we go down and down to athlete level you will get small sample size even though some of our teams that have been with us and they have been with us for for years so we have a lot of bank of data built up with those customers which makes it easier for us but it, there's interest a, a, across all the levels a lot of time there's comparison so what you'll find is that teams will be interested in comparing say I'm just going to like their forwards to their backs and what are the key differences between those at the moment at an athlete level like I said small sample size uh, very very localized insights it, 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 it's quite good to to that we can we can turn those over but from a, a comparison point of view I suppose positional level would be um good and then looking across the different injury types as well so like one of the things that that we we understand here at Kitman Labs is that the actual manif- manifestation of injuries is quite com- complex and you could have like obviously the drivers for a hamstring injury are going to be quite different from the drivers for a shoulder injury for example so they're the kind of different areas that that people would like to compare different types of injuries different positions in their teams um and we provide the 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 analytical solution um for for our teams to be able to do that and you mentioned in your introduction that you apply uh, the this uh, model or the, the Kitman works with uh, some of your favorite sports, uh, rugby and some of your national sports. But what other uh, sports do you have you applied this model to? Yes. So we have, like I said, rugby would, would, is one. We have soccer teams. We have cricket teams. We have baseball teams, basketball, American football in Australia we've rugby league so we do have uh, like a broad range of sports across a broad range of continents that 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 contribute information into our system okay and so you're now a data scientist in a a playground of you know data around your favorite topic how do you approach uh trying to deliver insights to these teams with this data that they have yes so we work quite closely with our applied sports science team and our applied sports science team here at Kitman Labs, they deal directly with our customers, find out their needs and, f- and figure out um, if there, there's certain areas that we should be looking at from an analytical point of view. So our main kind of application and our main insights driver at Kitman Labs and, and what we've we've developed and what we've been working on to, to help reduce kind of injury risk uh, across our teams. We work on um, the basis that we, that coaches would like to know what are the things that are driving injury risk. So they collect all of this data and in our system, you can view that on a dashboard. So when they come in, they can see the dashboard, which allows them to view the current status of the athletes. And they can then set alarms on that data, an alarm being go red if if an athlete gets into a certain 
band or a certain range or over a certain amount of a variable or it can be green if you're happy with them the color coding thing kind of depends on the 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 personal preference of the practitioner so our practitioners traditionally could just set their alarms based on their own intuition and their own judgment and expertise but where we come in and where the the main analytics that, that that we work on here at Kitman is to provide data behind that and to potentially provide data-driven alarm thresholds for the practitioners to set that will fire when their athletes get into a certain range or you think they might be in trouble. So maybe to to apply some examples and, and be a little bit more concrete here, it sounds like you're saying that traditionally, or maybe not traditionally, but um, you know, one way of approaching keeping athletes healthy and in high performance zones would be to set a threshold that said, you know, that, that would allow a, 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 you know, one of the sports medicine staff at a team to say, well, you know, I'm concerned about overtraining. I don't want this athlete to train, you know, more than X hours a day. And so that's a, a intuition based threshold that they might set, but you're maybe doing some analysis or building some models based on the data that you've collected to allow them to more dynamically optimize those kinds of thresholds. Maybe, you know, based on, based on this starting point, maybe you can give us some specific examples and the kinds of, you know, modeling models and approaches that you might use uh, for different teams. Exactly. So I suppose from the first point is that we, we initially, from when, when we started on this journey, relating injury risk to to the different metrics in our system, the alarms that we set up, they were on a univariate level. So we started small and kind and kind of built it up along as 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 we continued through our journey. At a univariate level, we have a system in place that a practitioner can set an alarm, like you mentioned, a certain number of training hours per day. And then we provide the analysis for them to check that alarm and see how relevant that alarm is based on their injury risk. So they and can meaning, do, meaning what specifically? So one thing you're doing is you're allowing them to pull different data sources together so they can even easily track how many hours a given athlete has been training. Exactly. So once they put the the data into our system, it's all collated into a central repository and metrics that they wish to view or that they wish to set alarms on, that they wish to monitor for their athletes are displayed in their dashboard. Mm -hmm. So not not only are the, the, I suppose, the raw metrics displayed, we also allow them to create different aggregations and things that that they might be concerned about as well. So what you'll find is kind of in in a sports related area, obviously, if you're coming up to a game, the things that happen in the few days leading up to a game can be very important to determine whether an athlete is going to perform well in that game or not. So we allow them to to create different aggregations. For example, their workload over the last seven days, their max speed over the last seven days that they did in training. We allow them to look at different metrics in those types of aggregations. And also what is very important and what we found to be an important is like the change in those metrics leading up to the game. So we allow them to calculate Z scores and complex end scores. So they have an abundance of data that they can display across their dashboard okay. and set alarms off that, that I'm concerned if athlete goes into, does, as you said, over X hours of training per week. The analysis that we perform then takes that data so for their positional group or that that they that they're involved in and looks at how that that metric relates to the different types of injuries that other people in their positions would have gotten so that if they're concerned about that they can set the alarm or change their alarm based on what the data is actually telling them and use that then on top of their own intuition Tell me a little bit about the kind of the modeling process and how you as a a data scientist have built up these models over time. Yeah. So the most recent, I suppose, model that that, that we were working on was what I was talking about previously was all at a univariate level. So is this one metric related to injury risk? Mm -hmm. And more recently, we've developed into the, the multivariate alarm. So the idea with that is that the customers identify where their injury problems are, for example, They look at a a diagnostic injury for their season. They had a really bad hamstring problem. So they will access our system. 
And they'll say, okay, look at my, for this season, look at my hamstring injuries. And we have been built models that will turn around and tell them different types of injuries for different combinations of metrics. So the idea then is that they will choose an injury level that they're comfortable with, or they'll see at what, at what values for different combinations of metrics was, were my athletes at the higher injury risk? And then they can set that for their group of for their group of athletes. So going forward into next season, hopefully they'll get a warning if this injury risk increases. So from our point of view, then at the on the data science team, the key thing from us from a machine learning point of view is that our analysis has to be transparent. So while there are amazing models out there that would give you a really good risk score or a prediction, as they say, what we have learned and what I mentioned our collaboration with the sports science uh, team earlier, our customers in particular here, they need to know why. So here we need to know what's going on the going on in the box. Um, so the important thing for us is that the models that we use here are transparent, interpretable, and that we are able to build on top of the key metrics and figure out then what the optimal thresholds are for each of those metrics based on the, the injury risk specification for the injuries that the, the teams are interested in. And so what models do, does that leave you to use? So it would be the more, I suppose, traditional models, the ones that wouldn't be considered black box mm -hmm. that we would. So um, again, models that are quite transparent and easily interpretable, like in, in general, and some of, the, some of the analysis that we would perform, you would find decision trees would be quite an interesting approach to this because you automatically get both your related metrics and your specific thresholds um, that come true in terms of we then take output from that and kind of make it into a more consumable format because I suppose the, the kind of key crux of that is that the practitioners and the, the coaches using our system they don't have a lot of time so if we put a big massive decision tree up in front of them that's not going to be easily interpretable or consumable for them so we need to and, and that's one of the things that's really good about being a data scientist here as well is that we will work with design and product and figure out how that's going to be implemented kind of from a conceptual analytical point of view into something that's easily digestible for our coaches. Oh, that's interesting. Can you talk more about that process? Uh, where does it manifest itself? Does it impact the design that you will ultimately choose or the model you know, type or parameters that you'd ultimately choose as a data scientist? Or is it more with a given model that you've chosen for other reasons like performance, uh, the the way you communicate and display uh, the types of things that customers will want to know about from that model. Yes, yeah, so we will initially we will spend a lot of time in the conceptual formulation phase where we will develop the algorithms. Our general process would be to potentially come up with two or three different algorithms, compare them, build prototypes so that the prototypes can then be validated. So they can be validated both internally um, with the other members of our team. So with the product and design team, with the engineers, if I if it became that this algorithm needs to be implemented in our product, can we can you support that? Can you help us with that? But also for the, we would do external validation as well with our customers. So that would where be again where the collaboration with the sports science team would come in. They have the ability to take the prototypes that we build, show them to customers, we get feedback that gets implemented. And then again, it's, it's a massive collaboration effort. When all of that comes together, we go back to the design team, figure out how it's going to fit into the product. And it moves on then to, to engineering into the product and eventually then into the hands of the, the customers themselves. And so have you had situations where, you know, for example, you chose a simpler model because it was easier to present the results to customers or do you use the model, but invest extra on the presentation side after assuming a given model in place is in place? I suppose that, that, that there is a bit of both. We would always aim for the optimal model, but mm -hmm. we would always bear in, in the back of our mind that the optimal model that we build in our prototype against our data set, that it can be quite resource consuming and potentially not sustainable given the amount of data that we have that goes into the product. So we have, uh, like I said, a lot of collaboration with the engineering team to make sure that the solutions that we come up with are indeed implement, you are able to implement them into the product and that they won't 
break everything, that it won't be very slow. So we would do a lot of testing with the different types of data, all the aggregations that we have. And, and, and we would try to come up with something that satisfies every member, I suppose, of, of the team involved. And again, is the best model that will get good insights for our, our customers. That That's the, the most important thing is that the, the customers are getting the insights, the why I'm getting such an injury risk score and not just what the percentage is. And out of curiosity, do you use a lot of ensembles of models or do they tend to be simpler models? We tend to keep it more simple. Okay. Um, again, again, uh, the, the reasons the we've discussed. And the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the interpretability um, of models that we would use. I mean, in, in saying that the data science team, we like to, to be innovative in ourselves. So we would have departmental workshops whereby we would um, do things on, on the side like that, uh, try different types of models, mm-hmm. see how they would work. Um, while we're always dripping that forward. So at the moment, we are focused on actionable insights, key deliverables that the practitioners can combine with their own intuition to make their decisions. But that's not to say that that going forward for different areas that we might be getting into, that that models like that wouldn't be more, um, would be more applicable. All right. How is your product delivered? Is it a, a cloud-based solution where your customers are uploading their data centrally or is it mobile or, or desktop? So there's a, a web browser that uh, the coaches and the backroom staff, I suppose, get access to, to log into where everything is, is, is displayed. And through there, they would upload their information in terms of the EMR, electronic and medical records. Um, from the other ways we collect data, we have a, a mobile app. So we have a mobile app for the athletes themselves. So they install the app and they put in their subjective type measures. We have another mobile app for the coaches, which provides a summary of all of the information that they would see on the dashboard when they log into the web app. They get that on their phones. Um, you find, I think, in a, in sports complexes or in the training grounds particularly throughout the pitch they wouldn't have a lot of wi-fi so having something on the mobile is 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 um, more efficient for them we have the web browser as i mentioned and we also have a, a motion capture data collection system which is quite interesting um so we have a system where you stand in front of a camera and it uses infrared sensors to d- detect the athlete and we take them through a, a series of movements and they kind of follow a, a demo as it's going through, perform the movements, um, and we get all that di- data back into our system as well. And what types of analytics does that uh, does the motion capture uh, roll up into? So again, the, the, the outputs from that would, they get cleaned and transformed, but they would then essentially just become metrics on the teams can put onto their dashboards as well. So you would be looking for things like angle of your internal shoulder rotation or how aligned were your knees when you were doing a squat these kind of things so we have metrics that get derived automatically from them from the system a lot to do with alignment um between say the left and right side of your body um, and how good your your movement is as you you go through the the different movements we have like squats lunges y balance these kind of different things I was just talking to someone about they were they, uh, someone made a comment about how they wanted to get a like a workout coach or something like that so that they can you know get a, a, an analysis of their technique. Do you see that kind of thing being more commoditized uh, and available just via you know mobile devices and you know deep learning just kind of point the camera at, at you while you're doing your squats and. Uh, it'll tell you how good your technique is. Yeah, a hundred percent. I I think that that's the where where everything is going. I mean, like I I've mentioned that that our system that we have here is at the moment only currently provided to like elite teams and 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 professional athletes. But in saying that, I mean, with the kind of the prosumers of of the technology, like someone trying to to better themselves, say in a, in a more amateur type setting or as an individual sport all of these things are are applicable and there's such developments again in technology i mean there there's something new coming out every day that 100% i i would believe that 
like personal personal workout or your your own smart trainer your own smart coach these things are are, are definitely not too far down the line um for, from us with, with with all of the developments in technology that are happening yeah having said that i'm sure listeners will tweet me like five to ten companies that are already doing this thing yeah i, I wouldn't i wouldn't doubt that um i mean i know one of the things that that kind of always interests me and, and i think that where where we're going is is kind of the smart sports equipment and I'm, I'm sure that, that there are companies out there for example if you're using a equipment in, in your sport like for example say a baseball bat I've got, I'm sure there there are companies out there that are developing the technology to look at your motion as you swing it and and hit it and I mean I, I I'm I, I guess there are people out there even with footwear with boots or trainers that that people are wearing as they're performing that to, to detect from that as well so the the abundance of data that that's going to be coming in is is just going to grow exponentially I imagine <laughs> And so what do you see as the key challenges faced by data scientists as they're uh, working in fields like this with the the data volumes rising, but where a very personalized approach needs to be taken? I think the, the key the key challenges would be in, I suppose, I, identifying the, the noise that, 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 that is there from it. So as that becomes to, to kind of a more, a more personalized level, I think one of the one of the good things about these is that people like to compare themselves to other people of a, a similar nature. Mm-hmm. Um, so the challenges would be providing good insights at a localized level with with small sample size. Whereas the kind of benefit off that is that y- you can yield from from a larger data set of of similar population. Um, and and if people engage with that and get people engaged with it, with different ways that they can engage their customers and the the consumers of this information um potentially that would be where they can kind of overcome the challenges of small sample size and 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 that 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 would come from a more personal approach Mm -hmm. i was going to ask a related question to this earlier even uh with the with all of the teams that you work with and all of the athletes that play for those teams you know, often there is a situation where the the events that you want to model against your your interest set, you know, are injuries, which are relatively infrequent uh, as compared to your overall data set. Is that a challenge in your case? And how do you uh, address that challenge? Yeah. So within our data set, like one of our challenges that we have is that you have teams that they screen differently. So it, it, you can have a team that will require their athletes to, to go through screenings one day a week, or you will have teams that will require their athletes to go through it three days a week or five days a week or every single day, depending on whether they're training or not. Okay. So that uh, can be a, quite kind of one of the challenges. So it, it can be quite difficult to, to, to compare two different teams if they have completely different training methods. And when we're delivering our, our insights back to our customers that, they, they're aware that it's all their own data. And if anybody wants something at a kind of a more aggregated level, we will have the caveat that you are aware this is different sport, different, et cetera. So used as a, a kind of a, a guideline. In terms of, for, from our point of view, we would have, and, and it's quite good, a lot of our teams would have compliance rules. So they would require their athletes to screen a certain amount. So we're aware of that. So we know how often the athletes are screening and how they're meant to screen before we kind of attach any analysis to what they're doing. So, I mean, for one team, they screen three times, another team, they screen once a week. We know that. So we can then adjust any analytics that we perform for them kind of according to that. And you would have, as I said, the the compliance and the, the, the teams would expect, I think some of them, it, it can be in their contracts that they're required to, to, to screen a certain number of times a week and to provide data. How do you do that from a you know techniques perspective? And is this a kind of a sampling exercise or normalization exercise? Or how do you uh, work with your data so that you can allow folks to compare metrics that have different uh, you know volumes of sampling coming in? Yes. Yeah, so we, in general, like we we would, I suppose have the problem of you would have missing data if, if athletes don't scream on cer- screen on certain days. We tend to look to the customer and ask them 
So why we would have, obviously there are, are statistical methods and as you mentioned yourself, normalization and, and different things and taking the average over a certain period of time or rolling the last value that they had forward to all these different or imputing by a model, all these different things. We tend to work with customers and see how they would they would feel about that. So what do they think would be the best approach for them for their own specific analysis? And that would be kind of an option. It's not currently built in, but something that we are looking to to go towards. So even if there is a very poor quality of metric collected, they have the option not to include that in any analysis. So, for example, if they only for the the period of time that they choose, if they only have valid data for, say, 10 percent of the time, just we're not going to include that at all. Just don't. There's not enough information for the the games. If it's something that's screened quite infrequently or something, you'll find that, that they might screen and collect for a while and then not not collect after that. So, again, it, it is quite and like I said, we do with collaborate quite closely with our applied sports science team who are very close to the customers and take that guidance. So, for example, one of the things that that if, if we were to impute by a model, there would be the question that, well, how is that number calculated? And that, that kind of led, would lead to, to more questions being asked. So it is quite on a team by team basis. And we would do a lot of collaboration with people on, on making that decision for themselves. Okay, so make sure they understand the various trade offs and, and surfacing those trade offs via the tooling. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And out of curiosity, mentioning tooling, what kind of tools are, are in your tool chain? So the data science team here at Kitman Labs at the moment utilize mostly R and Python. Okay. So a lot of our analysis is carried out in R. The prototypes that we build in R uh, using uh, the Shiny app that would be sent out for validation and where everything that, that, that would eventually end up in the product kind of grows from. But we're kind of um, developing Python type stuff as well at the moment. So there, there's a little bit of both going on. And you mentioned Shiny app. What's that? So uh, Shiny is uh, part of the R Studio package. Okay. So Shiny allows you to take all the code and display it in a web browser and build your own little mini application, basically. So that's okay. kind of what, what we do with the analysis and, and set it up so that the, the sports science team can can go and take it out to site and they don't need us with them that they can click around and make selections and it runs the analysis and displays things back to the the, the customers okay uh, so it sounds like you're actively involved in helping sports teams further their performance help their help keep their athletes uh, healthy where do you see this going what are the opportunities for teams to use the the data that they have available and the data that you know will soon be available to them yes yeah, so i mean at, at the moment we and, and up until now we've been very injury focused so again the idea would be to, to keep the athletes healthy that we we would instigate the alarms that would allow them to to identify when when a potential athlete could, is potentially at risk going forward and for them then to make their their own judgment and decision about what the action to take on that is so should they potentially reduce their training load or get them to screen again these kind of things so from the injury type of view we've we've kind of been looking at individual risk factors the interactions of those and identifying kind of different types of responders then to to a, an, an action or an intervention um, is somewhere where, we're, where we think that, 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 that we might carry on with this and eventually kind of to work towards the, the forecasting and proactive planning. So to, to, to kind of look forward and say, OK, in the next week, these athletes should only do this workload and this workload. So, so that's kind of the, where, where, where we'd like to get into from a, an injury point of view. Also, moving on from that then is, is kind of what's becoming quite evident and important is kind of the performance in games. So we have a lot of information about our athletes and the, the information that they give us, the butchers, we call their psychophysiological metrics. And at the moment, we've been really injury focused with that, but we're hoping to move into the area of in-game performance and see how the, the information in our system relates to how they perform in games. So there are lots of companies out there, Opta, Instat, et cetera, providing breakdowns of, of how players performed in games, their technical metrics, how many shots they missed, they scored, tackles missed, interceptions, et cetera, depending for all the sports. And, and we're hoping to, to get to an area where we can relate what's in our system 
with, with those things and, and move on to, to performance in games. So we, we, we are hoping to, to get to an area, a time where you can assess potentially when teams are more likely to beat a team, they do these certain things and the psychophysiological metrics that are in our system how we can relate those and, and, and try and get our teams to, to, to boost their performance and increase their chance of winning. Well, Sinead, thank you so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you're up to there. It sounds like you're doing some really interesting things. Yeah. Um, and long, hopefully it will continue like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for chatting to me. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on Sinead or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimmelai.com slash talk slash 155. To follow along with the AI in Sports series, visit twimmelai.com slash AI in Sports. And if you're a fan of the podcast, we'd like to encourage you to click into your podcast app and leave us a five-star rating and review. They are super helpful to us as we push to grow this show and community. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.